Gormagander has the ignominious record of longest time on the Federation Endangered Species list. Orion Hearts have six valves, and the Trill have rejoined the Federation. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. Today we are doing a review of Discovery Season 3, Episode 13, That Hope Is You, Part 2, directed by Olatunde Osansamni, Sanmi. I think that's right. Written by Michelle Paradise, we are joined by a very special guest, the artist known as Skillet. Hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing all right. Good. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this action-packed season finale for season three of Discovery. Uh, first things first, thank God the Gormagander's back. Am I right? Yay. Yeah, the Gormagander. Uh, what are the? What is the Gormagander? Uh, space whale. It was a yeah, it was a big, <clears throat> fly sort of blobby looking space thingy. Yeah, I think it was mentioned in Lower Decks again, but it was originally introduced in uh, season one of Discovery, and then brought it back again when Harry Mud flew in on a Gormagander in one of the episodes in season one. But anyway, that's what it is. It's a space whale. That just got out. And, and yeah, we should definitely keep talking about the Gormagander for the whole hour. It is so important. <laughs> yeah, he, was best, he, was best, he was the best part of the episode. No! no. <laughs> oh, okay. So the Gormagander got a uh, non-appearance mention then. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, also, I was thinking for this episode, we should call the doctor Culber Hugh, since he's a Bajoran and they switched their names, right? So uh -huh. Culber Hugh, Dr. Hugh is what he would be called as a Bajoran. That's all I got. Oh. What do you guys have? Oh, that's it. <laughs> good, good, good talk. Good talk. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. <laughs> that was it, huh? Uh, I got one Harry Mud Sally. Very good. Yeah. That's what I got. I got no jokes for you guys. They'll come. Uh -huh. They're, they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll come. <clears throat> I, I was surprised you didn't mention the Alcorian Sorrow Hawk. Yeah, there was that. Uh, that does follow the Star Trek trope of every time they describe somebody, they give like a simile, and it's always a planet that usually starts with an A and ends with an I-A-N and then is uh, an animal that we know here on Earth. Like they'll be like, oh, he flies like an Altarian space seagull. <laughs> every time, why? It's every time. It works. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think the last time we heard something like Albanian cave sloth or something. Yeah. <laughs> So you're knowledge. right. Good knowledge. Deep Space Nine. <clears throat> yeah. I'll slaughter you like an Alcorian sloth. <sighs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> Meanwhile, Al Alcorian sloths are actually, you know, quite violent animals. Not like the Earth sloths that we may have heard of. Oh, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a misnomer. Mm. They choke you to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sloths are, boy, they're not scary things. Maybe they but are on really Alcoria, violent. On Alcoria, they're much different. Maybe they're super violent. Yeah. They're just so slow that we have no idea. They're like, I really <laughs> like want to kill you. And they're like, oh, he's hugging me. <laughs> so anyway, we've got uh, Saru and, and Sakal that are hanging out. Uh, Adira pops in. And uh, Adira is now Zahian, mm -hmm. which is an alien that we saw on Picard and on Discovery with Poe. Poe was a Zahian. What do you think of the uh, the choice of Adira as a Zahian? I mean, I thought I thought it, I thought it was a great way to sort of like keep bringing that species back in. Um, you know, the fans sort of like you know the lexicon of characters and um, species that they have. You know, Poe isn't just a one-off character. And really, she's one of the only people that we met, um, you know, 
in Discovery so far. So yeah, I definitely thought that was an interesting choice because um, I was definitely very excited to see what yeah. she was going to be. Right. Um, and I was like, oh, it's so cool. And seeing the makeup on her was really cool. I thought they did a really good job. Mm -hmm. And then Gray pops in as a Vulcan or Romulan, which was, probably which a Vulcan. Was, which was just adorable. <laughs> I thought that was so, I thought yeah. that was so sweet. Um, and then, you know, sort of, you have to also think about how interesting the AI is on that, on this hollow ship, you know, this program that, um, you know, his mother created for him and his family created for him where they're able to recognize that there is a, a sentient, you know, if not corporeal, there's a sentient be being with Adira and they were able to, you know, put that, you know, being into you know physical form so i thought that was a really great um sort of like thing that they did recognizing gray as being actually sentient and not as we some fans have probably thought like oh she's just going adira is going crazy and right. this is a really great affirmation of you know her being a very big part of like this unique experience and having you know not only her ex boyfriend but you know a former host being quite literally in existence we don't know how but I think that was really cool and he looked adorable as a Romulan Vulcan I thought it was just I thought it was really cute yeah yeah so I don't know that this is where this is where we kind of fast forward to the end and say do we think that they are going to incorporate Gray into season four as an actual like not just an imaginary friend kind of thing or Adira's memory or Trill symbiont, whatever, but actually kind of like how uh, Skillet, you'll remember uh, on Voyager, the doctor, the doctor's hollow emitter. Maybe they'll figure yeah. out some kind of technology to actually make Gray a character that everybody sees and that interacts. Do you guys think they're going to do that? Because it seems like that's the direction they're taking it. Yeah. Um, I, I hope so. Um, if not ha you know, having Gray be a regular character, he wasn't a regular, you know, this season. Um, but I think the technology that they could explore behind, you know, um, making him come to life would be really interesting. You know what I mean? We, we've already, you know, convinced his Admiral to investigate the burn and, you know, for him not to hate, you know, Commander Burnham and, you know, realize, you know, she's actually got something happening going on here and for them to trust them. And now it's like, Hey, Adira's got an imaginary friend. You've got this technology. Can we try to bring gray to life? <laughs> and, and, you know, and so it's just kind of like, excuse me, you want to use, you know, this technology to do what? So I think that would be interesting to see if they, you know, explore this. We have to convince Starfleet that there's a being here that you can't see and we need to, bring him to life. Can we use your hollow emitters, please? So I think that would be interesting if they do explore that. Maybe not too much, but um, I think it would be a good idea. I think it would be, I think it would be really nerdy. I think it'd be really nerdy because you know, this. you know, <laughs> Star Trek fans are kind of like, you know, exist in different levels or some who are really there for the humanity of the stories and some there who just really there for like the tech, some who there for the space babes, you know what I mean? So I, I think like the techie, the geekies, you know, the geeks will really be like, oh, it's so cool how they did that. So yeah, I, I hope they incorporate that. Hmm. Yeah, and what's interesting to me about Gray's character, I thought it was well used in the scene where Gray had to go through the radioactive kind of force field that was separating them, right. which, is, which is a power that could be used later on down the road. It, right. It's actually like, being able to walk through walls or some kind of power that you have, right? Agreed. Uh, which they can go definitely um, expand upon. But the other thing I really like about Gray is the fact that Star Trek really has a, um, a way of including people and making fe people feel like they have a, a belonging, a sense of belonging. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that, that really builds its fan base and has made people gravitate towards it. And I feel like th they are actually using Gray as this this exact same kind of um, uh, explanation to the to why they do this. Gray is the outcast character who doesn't feel like they belong, who doesn't even feel like they're recognized. 
mm. and and you see how uh, how much they're going out of their way, Colbert in particular, and uh, Stamets to to make sure that that they are accepted. It's somebody who is not seen, who's not you know, who nobody else knows exists, who's even not even person. alive, <laughs> yeah, somebody yeah, like, who actually yeah. is dead, <laughs> right? And even they have a chance to find. Um, acceptance and the sense of belonging. And I think that's important um, as far as checking a box off which Star Trek does so well. But that is, that is an interesting thought where it's like, not even death can get you to, like, you're dead, <laughs> doesn't matter. We're bringing you back as a character. Uh, and they're gonna have to like, if they're, they are able to do that, then they're really going to have to study Grey's Anatomy to, no, but uh, the point is, what I'm trying to say is, no, that, but no. what, what you're saying about how him having a, a special power, that is something that every Star Trek series does have. Like they, Next Generation had data that was immune to just about everything because he's an android. Uh, Deep Space Nine has Odo, who is immune to a bunch of things and is special because he's a changeling. Uh, and, and the Voyager has the Doctor, who, you know, when everybody passes out and dies, the doctor just goes, oh, well, I guess I'll go revive everybody. You know, <laughs> so every Star Trek series kind of has that person with this superpower of like, well, you know, this doesn't hurt me because I'm just an imaginary friend or I'm just a hologram or whatever. Um, right. But then it asks, begs the question, if they can do this for Grey, then does that mean that the entire Trill homeworld is about to populate itself with the memories of dead Trill people? See, I, I would have to say no, um, because if this was a known thing that your past hosts come, come back to you, um, I think that would be something that's like either known throughout Star Trek canon, or at least maybe something that was mentioned to Adira as a new host after she affirmed herself, uh, after, excuse me, after they affirmed themselves. Um, and I, I think that would, um, definitely be something that would have been mentioned because uh, a bunch of hosts walking around with their imaginary <laughs> past they might, hosts. They yeah. might find out now that they do it and go, wow, you know, and then it becomes like this whole, you know, I mean, ethic, like ethical question, you know, there's a lot of gray area there. <laughs> God, yeah. I, mean, I feel like, you know, you have a hundred, hundreds of people walking around, you know, with voices talking to them and they just don't tell anybody. Like, are you, like, I, I think that's highly unlikely um, that you just have, you know, people just like, oh, you had someone talking in your ear all these years. You've been a host. Me too. And me too. And me too. And it's like, no one said anything. So I, I, like, I might have to, we might have to do a little like gentleman's bet with that. And like, you know, I'll definitely mail you a dollar if I'm wrong, but um, I, I don't think so. No, it's true that that is the special case that Adira is. Uh, Adira's human, and so this is a different reaction that has never happened before. Um, so maybe the other Trill aren't even aware. Well, I mean, they do have the memories though. I mean, it's, anyway, it's, they, they could do it. Here, here's, here's the thing is, I really, really, you know, Culber's one of my favorite characters. And when Culber died, um, I was bummed out because I didn't want, you know, one of my favorite characters to be gone. So, so when they brought him back, I was very happy about this, but I thought that the way they did it, the science with which they used just broke. I was just like, this is not, I, I wish they would have found a different way. Now it's really hard to find a way to bring somebody back that's dead and make it believable scientifically speaking so now i'm worried about this again with gray because you know having gray back as a character as an actual uh co corporeal type of character would be cool but i'm worried about it's going to be really hard to come up with some you know fake science where we don't go uh that doesn't make any sense you know <laughs> That's I mean, concern. are we sure that Adira is 100% human? Is she part data Z? Do we know anything human, other I believe, yeah. about them? I don't know 100%. I think it's, I think it's safe to say Adira is 100% human, though. Okay. Sorak, have we heard anything different? I don't know. I haven't heard anything different. Like they've got like a great-grandparent that's like, you know, 
beta Z and they just, they didn't know. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, that's why. It's, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to be one of the things I'm interested in for season four. So I, I was kind of interested in seeing somebody die in this episode, which I didn't get to see. And I was a little bit let down. Who did you want to see die? Somebody, one of them. I didn't know who. <laughs> just I anybody? You just, wanted, you just wanted I thought, blood. I thought Gray was going to die, actually. I thought Gray was going to opt out of... I thought Gray was going to say, I'm good with being in this in this simulation where I'm actually invisible or something to that effect. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And, and stay behind. Um, the simulation so ended and the ship exploded or fell apart. Yeah. Something though, I just thought something was going to happen either with Gray or then the um, other lieutenant who who was who says she can hold her breath for ten minutes. I I thought she was going to. Oh, die oh too. I thought she might die too. I thought that this might be her her swan song. You know, although I will say, this is this is definitely a discovery hallmark. Okay, this this happens often to where I think twenty years from now we'll be laughing about this as the discovery hallmark, which is six people are trying to save the ship or they're trying to do this mission and they're all about to die. And they say, Oh, well, you're the only one that can do it. Hurry. We're all about to die. And she goes, okay, I will. I love you guys very much. And I just want to take this time to really, and they're like, we're actually dying. Can you just hurt? Show us how much you love us by going. Yeah. And, but they, they keep doing that where it's like, time is of the ess essence. Captain, we only have four seconds left. And they're like, okay, I just want to let all of you know right now. They're like, just yeah. hurry, do it. Yeah. I mean, disco is a little emo. I mean, <laughs> like, like, let's just uh, listen. We know this by the fanboys crying about it on the internet at nauseum all day, every day. Yeah. This goes a little emo. Like, it's, it's 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 how it is. You know, they've got the talent for it. They've got the heart swelling music, and they've got you know the beautiful camera work. It's definitely super emo. So I think you know. I mean, yeah, maybe it'll be something that the writers and the directors will look back on one day and be like, wow, like. Why are we all so like into our feelings? You know, they, they might do that. There might be like, we were really proud of that we made something that was that heartfelt every fourth scene. There's always something with Star Trek series where we look back 20 years later and we're like, Deep Space oh. Nine was so fill in the blank or next year. And, and we laugh about it fondly. I think this will be the thing with Discovery. It'll be, this will be like the running yeah. joke. They were, they, they, were, they, were the, they were the emo kid in the back of the class. <laughs> So, I, and I'm okay with it for right now. So, uh, but I was definitely happy that it all worked out. You know, I did think that Soraki, I did think somebody might die here. I thought it might be her sacrificing herself, which would be a bummer to lose her, but it would be cool to lose her in a cool way, in a way where she's out like saving the day. And everybody was like, Everybody survived. Everything was cool, but it was a good moment. You know, she was, uh, what was it? She used to go uh, diving for abalone, right? Free diving. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing Which I is... thought was weird, weird about that scene was like, they just needed her to go into the warp core or something to, to put that, that thing. And I'm like, why didn't they send the robot in the first place? I knew place? you were going to say that. Just, you know, where are the robots? Where are the robots <laughs> The, the robot showed up before that scene, like, hey, we're here to help, you know. I think most of them had gotten, like, blown to bits, and that one kind of just came randomly out of nowhere. Because remember when they were in the firefight, they were, the robots were using themselves as, um, as cover? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Point. oh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know where that one came from, even. So. But I will say that it was miraculous how that – that robot was completely decimated and Owo had like not a scratch on her. <laughs> it's like, you guys could have given her a chafed shoulder. Anything. <laughs> yeah. But still, whatever, it works. We get it. It was cool. It was fun. Yeah. Dot 23s is what they're called. They're so adorable too. The dot 23s. I like I the special effects of, uh, of Burnham 
when in that fight scene she had with Osira, when Osira kind of pushed her into that wall, I really like that special effect. Yeah, what let's was talk that about wall? Let's talk. What was that wall? I maybe I missed it. I feel like maybe that's one of their um because it's it was made of the same material that they used to um you know, personalize their consoles. Programmable um, matter, I think. Is yeah, right. so maybe that was, um, you know, that's maybe that's where the, maybe that's where it lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, or maybe, you know, because that was there, that was the ship's data center hub. So maybe they need a lot more pro programmable matter in there because there's multiple people doing multiple things. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever maybe it is, it's, yeah. it's some kind of programmable matter. Um. But what were you saying you wanted to talk about, Carmen? Yeah, hey, let's I mean, talk about, good. there was multiple fight scenes. I mean, there was, you know, Burnham and Osira. There's the, you know, the shootouts between the lieutenants. Um, there were, there was the turbo lift fights. Um, there was the... Great effects the, in the turbo um, lift. I, emotional I actually, fight. It was actually so yeah. good that I kind of lost where we were. I was like, wait, are we flying through space? Where are right. we? And then when they got to the other, I'm like, oh, we're just flying through the ship? Yep. That was very confusing, but it looked so cool. It was really cool. Effects are still through the roof. Music is through the roof. You know, unbelievable. So, you know, sometimes you go, I don't even understand what's going on anymore, but it's just so fun to watch and, and really well done and super produced. So, yeah. You, I thought... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I thought, like you were saying, as they're flying through this turbo lift system, um, and you don't really know what they are, where they are until they're coming to an actual, like, port to, for the elevator, essentially, to stop. And that, it's just so cool um, how they sort of, like, kept the movement of everything going, and it looked really fluid. Mm -hmm. um, I was really impressed by that, and it didn't look fake. Um, and um, especially when you, you know, you, you think about how far turbo lift technology has apparently come, you know, from next generation, Picard was stuck in a turbo lift um, and had to climb up a ladder with the kids. And, and it's like, we always knew that the turbo lifts could go up and down and right. side to side, but this suggests that it's advanced to the point where the turbo lifts are independent of any sort of, um, um, ropes or pulleys or a shaft um and that they can literally freely go any i always did wonder that about you know like ever since we've been back and it's like they seem to get from deck to deck like instantaneously like <laughs> turbo lift rides are so much shorter this season i'm like how are they getting everywhere so fast and yeah. it's like oh okay so because they a, can just fly there's a everywhere. ton of empty space on that ship too they gotta be, they should have some storage bins with all that empty it's, space. It's almost kind of like you thinking about the human body and our circulatory system. And it's kind of like, you know, our blood is moving in various veins all throughout our bodies. But then it's like, how is, you know, it's still so filled up by other things. And it's like, but that just looks so hollow. Just like you said, you know, it's like, it, it seems like a lot of like a lot of wasted space. They're definitely cool, but a lot of wasted space. <laughs> so yeah, just um, yeah, that was that. It was definitely yeah. The turbo lift shaft. Air, I don't even know what we're calling it anymore. It can't really be a shaft because it's not up and down and left and right. Um, the turbo what do you lift. Siroc, would you call it a shaft? Face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, no, I was I was thinking if you like the turbo lift, then you'll really like the escalator lift. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, um, I was thinking the same thing. Really good scene. I love that the fight scene in the turbo lift. Um, it did look. Um, it reminded me a little bit like of Star Wars for some reason or another. Um, when they have those lightsaber scenes in the middle of you know, right. that ugly space. So I, I kind of thought of that. I did like that it was moving and it was uh, giving us an insight to how they actually get around inside the turbulent. Because that's a question that yeah. I think we all had, just the mechanics of it, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we all had like a visual of it, but we never really seen it uh, on screen. And I think that was pretty good depic depiction. So shout out to the director and uh, them putting that together with the visual effects people.
A um, lot of fight scenes, though. I think I have to say it, almost too many fight scenes for me because it was <gasps> yeah, a little bit too much. <laughs> oh, oh. No, I did find it. Yeah, I found that there weren't a lot of notes I could take because there wasn't a lot of plot or story. It was just the culmination of the previous 12 episodes. And they're like, okay, and here's all the fight scenes. (laughs) Like, there wasn't a lot of actual plot, right? Exactly. Um, The most of the... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, most of it was fight scenes, so there wasn't much to write down. The, I think the, the meat of the storytelling for me was uh, Sakal's performance with Saru, and I thought Sakal was in, did an excellent job with his part of the story, which was his family and, and dealing with you know how the burn began. So that was most of the storyline for me as, as far as like performance. The rest is the action stuff is not really... <laughs> There's not really anything to write down, you know, two people fighting in the elevator or something. But. <laughs> it's fun to watch, though. Uh, it was but fun yeah, to watch. There was definitely a lot of the, the story with Sakal. Um, so the burn happened because he got sad about his mom dying and he screamed. Um, but they, they explained it. But then I was worried. I'm like, are you sure you want to show him? this thing all over again what if he screamed what if it's just a little scream what if it's just a little gasp that's still enough to wipe out a few hundred ships maybe right (laughs) yeah (laughs) this guy's pretty powerful so what's up he and saru now are gonna go do their own thing yeah they they showed it yeah they are doing their own thing he's basically integrating him um their culture Mm. and i love the yeah, we're fast forwarding a little bit, but I love the scene on their planet and just seeing it look so much more advanced than it did when we first met Saru uh, when he was right. recruited. I thought that, like, I definitely got a little like emo at that moment because it's so it was so be- it was so beautiful. But then it's just like, wow, look how far the Kelpians have come, and you know, just so happy. Like, and of course, Saru is like, oh my god, they're in the Federation. What was that a, you know, a few episodes back uh, where he got kind of like choked up about that. So yeah, I thought that was um, a good choice to kind of like show the two of them at the end, sort of like sitting and watching the night sky. Um, and yeah, I thought that was a beautiful moment. I'll be sad to see Saru go if he indeed he does. I mean, he might still be part of the production but if he's just out gallivanting on, you know, Kaminar, then that won't really hold, you know, the same interest for me as having him on the ship with most of the uh, the storyline and most of the characters. I think they're going to give him his own ship. On Kaminar? What no, think? I, I think they're just going to give him his own ship, his own commission. Or Burnham's going to screw up again and he's going to get discovered back. <laughs> or, yeah, or Burnham might say, hey, I need a first officer, but then she's kind of got Tilly. Uh, I know we're jumping around, but Jesus Christ, you guys, how cool were those uniforms? So cool. Those were the best so far. Like, I know there have been a lot of wardrobe, a lot of outfits, a lot of, but this was the one that by far looked the sharpest to me. Now, I, but I don't know what the, I'm talking about. Sirach is the wardrobe expert here. What do you uh-huh. think, Sirach? What do you think of the the new uniforms they had in gray with the stripe of color? Yeah, um, I like them. I like them. Okay. I don't know if they're the best right now. Um, so far, I think Colbert's all white outfit has been the best outfit I've seen so far. <laughs> or Colbert's mirror universe outfit too was super sharp. We're- I'm right. And that was hot. Uh, maybe he just makes everything look good because he looks good he as a Bajoran too. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, he does. He does make clothes look good. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I did see that they had the new outfits. I wasn't really. I didn't put too much emphasis on. It. I didn't really like study it as not enough. Um, I thought it was kind of like the one that Admiral Vance was wearing. So I didn't really see right. that it was different. It is. No, it is. You're right. Okay. Okay, it's so. like the it's the present day Starfleet uniform that they've now integrated into. Okay. Okay. So we have seen it. I just haven't seen it on the crew yet. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I definitely like the I like the uniforms. I, I mean, I like them since they've been in this century. 
And I was just like, are, are they going to, when are they going to change them? Um, so it was definitely, you know, aesthetics aside, I just thought it was a really nice moment yeah. to have cool, cool. her come out onto the bridge, you know, flanked by her officers and everyone kind of like now firmly taking their place um, 900 years into the future with the proper attire. <laughs> right. Now they're, now they're totally and completely integrated right. into Starfleet. Absolutely. I'm, I'm just looking forward to people cosplaying in that uniform at, at the next Star Trek convention in 2029. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, might but we will see it. Um, well, if yeah, it's in 2029, I have, I have time to, I actually <laughs> have time to like build that cosplay. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'm sure people will use that to cosplay. I think it looks super sharp. What were you going to say, Sirac? Um, I was going to say that, you know, watching this show so far since the beginning, I've always felt that Burnham was the captain of this ship right. and the leader of the show. And they've taken it away from her. They've given it to other people. I think Tilly had it for a while. Um, and it seems like she's finally getting her just deserves for the kind of leader that she is, right? She takes risks. She's she's adventurous in her approach, but she gets the job done. And I think she's finally getting the recognition. And it just makes me think in some ways as uh, a black person, it feels as though you always have to kind of put in more work to get the same amount of recognition. So I, I wanted to highlight that. For I'm saying though. I'm saying. So she, you know, she, she saved the day, the universe, the galaxy, the future, the past. I a mean, few times. A yeah. few times. So, I mean, Captain pretty much, Delete. pretty much every episode. <laughs> right. So I'm like, you know. So what's the uh, what's the saying? Long. We we have to work twice as hard to get half as much. You know. I'm no, I'm glad that she's getting just as and much. She personifies that. Right. Do you guys yeah. think that she'll be the head of Starfleet when the series is over? Because I predicted when everything first started that she will, you know, I'm like, obviously she's going to end up being captain. There's nobody that doesn't think that she's going to end up being captain at some, at, but I thought it was either going to be at the end of the series, she'll finish off as the captain of the discovery and fly off, you know, or she's going to end up being the, the head of, Starfleet or the, or the Federation president, which I thought was less likely, but now that she's already captain, then that means it's not, the C series is not going to end with her becoming captain. So maybe she will be the Federation president when it all ends. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, but I mean, past captain really doesn't matter for me, uh, whether she's the Admiral or the Federation of Planets president. Um, I think the, I think the captain status is really where it matters the most because you're the leader of the ship and this, this is a technically a ship based show. Uh, our, all of the shows are ship based shows. So to me, she's made it to the pinnacle. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily feel let down if she doesn't get another promotion or she's not an admiral or something to that effect. I'm not going to be let down. Um, but I was let down that she had to take this much, put this much into getting the captain, uh, you know, unanimously, because she has been the all, uh, all the all out leader of this uh, crew since the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's interesting you say that, you know, um, I hate I hate this sort of like thing that goes around whenever you have a strong female character, whether she be black, white or other. Um, Oh well, she can do everything, and she's a Mary Sue, you know. Oh, you know Daisy Ridley and you know Star Wars. You know, um, um, Ray is a Mary Sue, and it's like, oh, she can do. It's impossible that she can do everything. Why not? First of all, Luke Skywalker, he could do a little bit of everything. Picard can kind of do everything. Um, Kirk could do everything, um, and it's like the captains are kind of like seen as this sort of like all-knowing, you know, all-encompassing sort of human being. So why Burnham, who grew up with two scientist parents who did deep space missions, and she grew up on a ship, and then raised by Vulcans, 
and then having this incredible career where she's got all these experiences. I, I don't, I never understand the sort of internet outrage. At, I just don't understand, you know, how she's, you know, capable of doing all this and how come she's so, you know, she's too good at, th yeah, that's the whole thing. She's too good at things. And it's like, you know what, just calm down because Picard is too good at things. You know what I mean? Kirk was too good at everything. And Thank so, yeah, you so for I think saying it's... that. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so definitely, you know, that's been very, very frustrating for me, Sirach, is, you know, um, watching the show and having enormous, enormous pride for Burnham and, um, you know, her journey and, you know, what she, her capabilities only to go on forums and be excited to talk to people about them. And they're just, you know, taking dumps on the character and how they write for her. And I'm like... You know, you don't say anything when Riker is just the best at everything. You say something when it's Kate Mulgrew. You know, you say something when it's Sonequa Martin-Green. You say something when it's Daisy Ridley in Star Wars. And so, yeah, it's definitely frustrating when you're, you know, seeing women kick ass and then seeing Black women kick ass and people have a problem with that. They're smart. They're strong. They're attractive. They can fix a ship. <laughs> they can take back a ship. Um, you know what I mean? And yeah, so it's it's always been very frustrating to me. But and I'm and I'm definitely I feel you there. Where I'm very very glad that she is in the captain's chair. And um, yeah. I hope she doesn't lose it again. But I'm I feel enormous pride that she has been promoted rightfully. She saved everyone multiple times. I, just, Every episode. Yeah. Yep. And just for the record also, you know, she hasn't uh, failed to convince me that she's capable of doing the things that she's been doing. I have I believe her when she's in a fight scene, for example, that she can really kick some ass. I don't exactly. say, you know, this girl looks like she couldn't kick anybody's ass. No, she, she actually is selling this. And she's selling that she's uh, compassionate. She's selling that she's adventurous or that she's a risk taker. Uh, she's selling all of these different elements of the character that I believe uh, come across genuine. So uh, the critique is always going to be there because people want to undermine what women are capable of doing and, and always right. try to make it look like, you know, it's just not believable when it is. Um, so I know we don't pay that any mind. I just, I'm just glad that she's able to get the, the recognition because it seems as though uh, everybody doubts her on this show, right? Uh, there was Saru was doubting her and saying, "I don't think you're making the right decision," and and Vance was doubting her and saying, "No, you're you're doing it wrong," and I doubt that you're gonna do it. Do you remember who didn't doubt her? I feel like Giorgio. She always had her back, right? Yeah. Even yeah, mirror Giorgio. Yeah, right. <laughs> And and so I guess it's the resistance of the doubt is what's make it what makes it so difficult, um, because that's something that's familiar to me, uh, where people doubt that you're able to do something or doubt your capabilities. Yeah. Um, and I just wish that she didn't have to overcome so much doubt. Mm -hmm. I could probably say a whole lot more because <laughs> I can. Well you know, I definitely, you know, sadly, we don't have feel, time. To no, say. no, I am. Yeah. I definitely, <laughs> but I will, could, I'm going to push I back, say, but I won't. I'm going to push back on this and talk about my favorite character. Uh, Captain Picard is not good at everything, not by a long shot. He's a good captain and he's a good diplomat. Um, he has done some fight scenes, but he's never been an action superhero. They did, you know, Starship Mine. He did a little bit of that one by one kind of thing. Uh, first contact, he had his moments. But for the most part, <clears throat> what I liked about Captain Picard was that he, he, was, he was kind of flawed. He knew his limitations. He wasn't Worf, you know, he wasn't a, a, an action superhero for the most part, usually. He wasn't out saving the galaxy every time. He was picking the right person to go save the day. He was hemming and hawing and being, you know, a diplomat and really trying to be, you know, a, a hero in a different way. And I, and I like that about him. So, you know, when you said Picard was good at everything, I was like, I don't know. No, no, no. I mean, I no, love no, the no. guy. I love you, the guy. You, but misunder he's definitely you misunderstand not. me. When I say he's good at everything, I mean, I'm, I'm saying he's good at the things 
Lakers wrote him into. You know, let, let, let's find a situation where he was not able to diplomatically talk them out of the situation. Do you know what I mean? Like when I say good at everything, I mean like, yes, he was a great diplomat, great captain, great leader. And so it's like there are, there are very few instances that you will find in the course of the seven seasons of the first show where he was incapable of talking, like even if it was in the last five minutes of the episode, Picard always somehow came through with this great sort of poignant thing to say and everyone was like, oh, okay. And I'm saying, yeah, within his wheelhouse, he could do everything. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that, like, you know, he could, like, you and know, everything was back. magically solved within 42 minutes. Yeah, that, yeah. So it's like I'm not, I'm not saying he was like great with the bat left. You know what I mean? Um, um, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not saying that you know he was great with kids because he wasn't. You know, I'm, I'm just saying that like within the 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 set of circumstances that they wrote for him, um, it seemed as if he could always just magically have the perfect you know, oratory skills to talk them into what they wanted or out of what they didn't want. Does that make more sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so I don't get well, killed in the comments. <laughs> so. Well, they can go ahead. I mean, whatever. No! We get killed. What was it? We got killed in the comments. Uh, every time I say something, uh, like, if I, like uh, twice I've quoted Chain of Command, and it was really uh, not Chain of Command. It was Best of Both Worlds. For some reason, I just say Chain of Command. People are like, you son of a... And there's like 50 <laughs> comments about that was Best of Both Worlds, and you know it. Like, we're doing it live, folks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really got to highlight something that I thought was really... Uh, it caught me by surprise because I forgot. And it was when um, Saru was talking to Sakal and he was going through seeing the images of his mom and seeing that whole thing play out. But the moment when he turned around and saw that Saru was not no longer a human, he was back in his um, alien uh, wardrobe and makeup. Yeah, I love that. I thought it was special because it was it was a reveal where I I, I wasn't even expecting it, and I love that moment where he's like seeing somebody like him for the first time and he's a much shorter kelpian by the way did you guys right. notice that yes but he was still wearing the shoes <laughs> right i checked too i was like is he even wearing the? does he even have hooves because he's so much shorter than saru he plays his character like max played rom by the way i kept i can't stop thinking about sort of like the, the the slightly sort of like hunched yeah yeah he, he, I thought like that was a beautiful and, moment. I thought that was an absolutely beautiful like, moment. Uh, yeah, the child, like, there's this childlike element to what he does that I feel like Rom also totally. has this child, childlike approach when he does things. Sort of tentative? Yeah. Yeah, no, I noticed the same thing. And he, it's, it's in his physicali physicality, it's in his, in, in his delivery. He's playing a scared child, a, a scared man baby, basically. <laughs> like he's a guy that's never actually seen the outside world, a guy that's just grown up for a hundred years playing with his own toys by himself. And he's just kind of like, well, what's, what's out there? You know, he's very, yeah, very, he's timid. He's immature. Uh, he's ignorant. He doesn't know what's outside in that world. Uh, apparently he's a pretty known actor. A lot of people are singing his praises. I don't think I've, I know him. Um, but, I kept saying that I thought he was familiar, but I didn't look at I didn't look up the actor's name yet. Oh, we only have a few minutes left. But speaking of familiar, Sirach, do you remember this uh, new character, Lieutenant Ina? Um, she's kind of like this new bridge character that just popped on like two or three episodes ago. Mm -hmm. um, there's just like you know, there's always Owaskan, uh, Detmer. There's Bryce and Reese, and then they added. Um, What's her name? The lady that played uh, Detmer to uh, the first Detmer. Um, she's also in there. And now there's another lady. I believe she has the bangs and we saw her in the mirror universe. And she was an actress that just like uh, Detmer, the character that played Detmer, she played a previous bridge alien 
um, and it was the Osnolus. Uh, it's kind of like this this taller, really big head thing with all these things coming out. If you'd ever see that character in the background on the bridge, um, and there were two of them on the ship, but there was one on the bridge. So she was one of that, or she was the one that was on the bridge there. And for whatever reason, that Osnolus is gone, and the actress is just playing <laughs> a human. And so that's her. Um, she also played an admiral in a scene in season three, you know, when, when Vance was talking to a bunch of admirals, she also played one of the admirals. Are you talking about the brunette? Yeah. Yeah. And I believe I she was has like, bangs. Yeah. She just I was honestly like, her, right? where does she come from? Who is that? But okay. <laughs> That's what it is. She's the character that played that Osnolus <laughs> alien. And now she, she stopped playing that. And now she's just a character that came out of nowhere. Just like, what? What what was the le lieutenant's yeah. name? <laughs> yeah, I was like I was like okay, I guess she's hanging out with all the cool kids. Did she go with them? She's good with me. But yeah, it was just you know like, are we supposed to know who that? Oh yes, yes. Oh okay, yeah okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, we're like, has she always been here? And we just right missed her? right. <laughs> Suddenly she's just there, and everybody's acting like she's always been there. We're like, has she always been there? <laughs> Yeah, that's how I feel about Jet every time I see her. <laughs> I'm like, did they just film all of Jet scenes in one day and they just broke them up and just placed them in different episodes? Because I swear she's standing in the same place all the time. I think that Tig Notaro, I, I think that she is just, I think she likes it, but I think she's all, she, I think she's probably somewhere just like, yeah, yes, Trek but not too much trick. Mm, so like, totally. yeah, she's probably like, you know, especially because, you know, she kind of likes to fly under the radar from what I've seen that she's probably like, put me in like a third of the episodes. And I think that would be okay. Yeah. yeah so the, the actress I'm she thinking of that line. played Arium was uh, Sarah Midich. And, um, but I can't remember. I can't remember what the character's name is, Sarah Minich, because she played, oh, Lieutenant Nilsson. So she was, you know, she was Arium for the first season. And then the mm -hmm. second season, she came as the blonde lady, uh, Sarah, uh, Lieutenant Nilsson. And then there's also another one um, that played Arium 2.0 that I think came back in the Mirror Universe as well. So all these characters that we've seen as both Ariums, as the Osnolus, they keep, they, they, they're like, well, we can use them again because we haven't seen them out of makeup. So that's really cool. Right. I mean, it's actually, that shows a lot of loyalty to the actor. Exactly. And, you know, you know, they don't have to yeah. sign a new contract with someone else. So since we only have a minute left, guys, any uh, final thoughts on season three or hopes or predictions for season four? Should I go? Um, <laughs> I, I thought it was, especially given not to get again too emo, um, given the kind of 2020 that everybody had, um, I think ending the season this way with such beauty and such hope, um, and a lot of love, um, I thought was a really good choice. I don't know if that was what the final episode was supposed to be from the beginning or if they maybe change it because they're like, everyone's had enough death and destruction this year, uh, last year. But I think to kind of like bring in the new year with this new episode being so beautifully shot and such great choreography, I thought they did a really good job of sort of like, you know, sort of giving us this hope. So I was really, really into the last episode. I'm so excited for season four. Again, they can start it with a completely clean slate. There was no cliffhangers. Um, so I'm definitely really, cause they can do anything. And I think mm -hmm. that's great. I think it's great when you have a completely blank sheet of paper and they don't have to pick up a thread, you know, from where it left off. So I'm definitely excited and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, my saw? thoughts are number, yeah, number one, I'm, I'm, I really love the way they've incorporated Kenneth Mitchell into this yes. show at the end of this series. That's my real highlight of this uh, last couple of episodes, of seeing him. And I hope that I get more of him on the next season. I also want to say kind of a, uh, to piggyback off of what you were saying, Carmen, um, 
about what we've been going through collectively worldwide with this pandemic and how people have had to make certain sacrifices so that we can get through this. And one of the things that I felt they were making a point of saying, which they actually did say directly in this episode, was the need to connect is at our core as sentient beings. And they were talking about our need to connect. And I feel like that was particularly placed in there to highlight the fact that even though we're going through all this, there is a hope for that uh, need of connection and their hope to fulfill that need. Um, and I also and that hope end... is you. Sorry, I just had to say that because that's and the title. The yes. hope is you. <laughs> Part two. And, uh, and then finally, I want to just bring a little bit of highlight to the Gene Roddenberry quote that they put at the end. And I feel like that's once again was um, placed in there for the fact that, you know, we're going through what we're going through collectively and mentioned something about all of us being aliens on this planet, trying to find friends and, and having people to uh, talk with. I, I'm, you probably have it in front of you, Ryan. No, but that's the one. Yeah. yeah. They, we all, yeah. we definitely yeah. all got that. Uh, that's a good yeah. one. Uh, well, you guys covered both things. I really kind of wanted to mention one was Kenneth Mitchell that it's amazing. They did it. And, you know, they've, they've left the door open in case he's willing and able to jump in for the fourth season, but it's not necessary. You know, it's just kind of like something that's open. And the other thing is kind of expanding on that is that, yeah, like, like you said, skill, like it's open. We can do whatever we want for season four. No, no cliffhangers, no, no forced things. We know that yeah. now it's just, okay. Here we are. Here's our ship. We're in our new uniforms. We're going to go out and do whatever it is that goes on in the 32nd century or whatever it is. Um, and more Oded Fair, please. Yeah. Yeah. Please, for the ladies. <laughs> and the boys. I think it's, And the boys. I think it's fair to have him. Um, that was a, <laughs> a last name joke. Anyway. So, uh, but thank you so much for joining us and everybody at home. Thank you all so much for playing with us for 13 weeks. Uh, we'll keep the Deep Space Nine reviews coming. We'll keep other things coming. We'll keep reviewing all the new stuff and it's going to be awesome. Any uh, final words before we go? My finger's on the trigger. Thank you both Black so alert. much for having me. I really appreciate it and would love to come back. Happy 2021. You are awesome. Hope to see you with us again. And happy 2021 to everybody. Yeah, definitely. Thank you all very much. And everybody at home, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>